Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're watching The Listening Post, working from home. This week, we're breaking from our usual format. For months now, we've been doing nonstop coverage of the media side of the coronavirus pandemic, from the misinformation being spread by governments, citizens, and journalists alike, to the war of narratives being waged by great powers. But COVID-19 has also brought out some of the best in the fourth estate, people who are producing vital coverage, some of which is designed and delivered in new ways to help us understand a breaking story that's rooted in medical science and laden with complexities. We have four examples from four different parts of the world, each using a different medium. From the United States and Brazil, countries whose presidents have repeatedly misinformed, we hear from two medical experts turned broadcasters, one through his podcast, the other over YouTube. Later, we'll take you to Europe and an aggregator that gets you around some of Silicon Valley's troublesome algorithms to analysis that you can actually use on COVID-19. But we start where the coronavirus story began, in China. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi now on Tsai Xin, a weekly magazine based in Beijing that's proven that even with all those Chinese censors watching and the authorities ready to pounce, it can produce some valuable journalism on the biggest news story of our time. No one can be truly safe during an epidemic. And yet these journalists from Tyson magazine take huge personal risks, conducting interviews and gathering information on the front lines. I have immense respect for them. What they do is extremely valuable. In one of the most controlled media environments in the world, Saishin Weekly is a dogged holdout. Since it was founded in 2009 by investigative journalist Hu Shu Li, the magazine has consistently tested the limits of free expression in China. In 2018, Saishin broke the story of a prominent Chinese CEO who had allegedly bribed an African head of state. Then, in 2019, the magazine exposed critical government failings that led to a chemical explosion in Jiangsu province, killing 78 people. Saishin does all this while walking a funding tightrope. 40% of its finances come from China Media Capital, a government-backed investment fund. It means they have to be hyper-careful about the work they do and whom they speak with. They rejected three interview requests from us, so we spoke with Jian Zhang, a former CCTV reporter and research fellow at the China Media Observatory in Switzerland. She has followed Saishin's output closely, especially their work during the COVID crisis. It was in the first week of February when Tyson published a four-part investigative series about the coronavirus in China. This was the first time I and many Chinese got to grips with the details of what was really happening during this epidemic. The series was a comprehensive and detailed piece of reporting. Tyson traced the rumours that an outbreak was imminent back to December last year, asking why it took so long for the public to be informed. They conducted extensive interviews with hospital patients and their families, questioning the official death count and looking at why the production of testing kits couldn't keep up with demand. They drew on the expertise of numerous Chinese doctors to hypothesize that Wuhan's wet market was not the only source of the virus. The questions that Tyson posed were the same questions people across the country were asking. The public mood was one of fear and uncertainty, and Tyson was shouting on their behalf. And what was the reception this coverage received in China, Jan? From what I understand about Saishin, it has a strong journalistic reputation, but it's not necessarily the most widely read publication. So what was the reach of its COVID-19 reporting? Saishin's uh, audience has always been China's social elite. Decision makers, government officials, business leaders, its style of reporting is not for everyone. During this epidemic, however, Tyson lifted its paywall on all its COVID reporting. As a result, many more people who would not normally read Tyson turned to the publication for the first time. 
As the magazine has become more well known, however, it has been exposed to more public scrutiny. In March, Tai Sin reported on the outbreak of COVID-19 in the United States. The article itself was objective and well researched, but the magazine's cover caused quite a stir. The implication of the image was that the virus originated in China and was having a knock-on effect around the globe. Many people on social media saw this as a betrayal to their country. Some even accused Tai Sin of working closely with Western media. This incident shows that as Tai Sin becomes an ever more important part of the Chinese media landscape, any editorial slip can trigger a significant social response. We were very keen to speak with someone from Tsai Shin for this piece, an editor or a reporter, and we wrote to them through multiple channels. Now, in some cases, we got just a polite refusal. In others, our email and messages just got no response at all. Now, other international media outlets like the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, they've reported similar experiences. Why do you think this is? What's behind this policy of silence from Tsai Shin? Such a policy of silence is not uncommon among Chinese media outlets. Indeed, foreign media will face the same problem trying to interview Chinese companies or individuals. I have experienced this a lot during my time working in China. There are two factors behind this. On the one hand, European and American coverage of China is one-sided and paints a picture of a system that is highly flawed. Therefore, many Chinese are convinced international media will only ever portray China in a negative light. There are misconceptions on both sides, and anyone looking for a Chinese perspective is likely to be refused an interview. Given that Tai Sin sits at the very centre of public discussion in China right now, it's not surprising that they would choose to be extra cautious about who they speak with. We all need media outlets like Tai Sin, and thankfully, it is not alone in the Chinese media landscape. Critical outlets like these are absolutely essential. I'll be honest with you, um, as a former health commissioner, every day I wish I were on the front lines of response. Um, and I know that the podcast is an extremely important uh, public service in a moment like this, and we hope that um, we're moving information to people. But, you know, every day I wish I was um, leading the charge in, in a place like Detroit. I sometimes feel like a general missing the war. This is America Dissected, and I'm your host, Dr. Abdul El Sayed. Dr. Abdul El Sayed is not like most podcasters covering the coronavirus. He offers a unique perspective. He's a trained physician, a former city health commissioner, and a political hopeful who ran for governor of Michigan in 2018. At a time when the amount of information is overwhelming and misinformed takes frequently hit the airwaves, El Sayed is attempting to bridge the gap with his podcast, America Dissected. America's COVID death toll has now surpassed every other country on Earth. And President Donald Trump continues to talk about opening up our economy. The podcast airs twice weekly, and in each 30-minute episode, El Sayed blends his own incisive commentary with interviews from high-profile politicians and medical experts, many of whom he's forged relationships with throughout his career. We're taking the time to join us today. Abdul, thank you so much uh, for having me uh, on the podcast. And America Dissected Coronavirus has adapted to the age of quarantine pretty creatively. Previously produced from a state-of-the-art studio, El Sayed now takes his audio equipment down into his mother-in-law's basement, where her women's clothing boutique makes for a surprisingly good place to hide away and record a podcast. Abdul, you started America Dissected to analyze the wide-ranging challenges facing the U.S. healthcare system. Now, the podcast is dedicated exclusively to examining the medical crisis we find ourselves in. What did you want to provide for your audience that you felt was missing? That's right, Flo. The, the whole goal of this podcast was to go beyond the headlines on some of the more familiar stories that people had heard about with respect to health. 
when COVID-19 hit us, um, we realized that this was the perfect space to get down to the science and the policy that matters most. But our capacity to test people at scale remains one of the most important things we have to be able to do. Let me break down why. What we want to do is, um, is, is find those contours of the conversation uh, that really do need more shading, more nuance, more understanding, and then really dig deep and find really great experts who can help us to understand uh, what's going on. Can you give me a few examples of the kind of experts you're talking about? The conversation that we shared um, quite early on with John Auerbach was really informative and important. We cannot continue to um, nickel and dime the public health system and expect that it's going to be able to protect the public. John is somebody who's been a city health commissioner, a state health commissioner, uh, and worked uh, at the highest levels of the CDC. Um, and so he was able to really break down how the CDC works, how these different levels of public health interact with each other. I also thought our um, conversation about the congressional response with Representative Pramila Jayapal was really critical. One of the things that's happening right now is states are literally bidding against each other for the very limited supply of essential equipment that we need. This is somebody who is uh, living it day to day, asking what is it that we do need to do on a federal level to deliver. And a lot of your friends and colleagues are actually on the front lines right now. What have you learned from speaking with them? I had a sense of what it might be on the wards, but it wasn't until I interviewed my friend Akash, uh, who is an emergency doctor, that I got a real sense of, of exactly what the challenges uh, are on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we've already seen what feels like thousands of cases. Nearly our entire hospital has been converted into an ICU with long rows of patients, young and old, sick and healthy alike, who are in medically induced comas, on ventilators. And I thought that was one of on uh, the more eye-opening uh, episodes, just to really get uh, an inside look on, on what folks doing this work are experiencing uh, every day. This is your first foray into journalism. Beyond access to a range of voices, how have you used your previous careers to your advantage? Yeah, look, I, I'm not a journalist and um, I don't attempt to be. I have a very particular viewpoint and um, I'm not hiding it. Uh, but I, as, a, as a practitioner, somebody who's worked in the healthcare system, uh, rebuilt a health department in one of the poorest cities in America, and then finally engaged in politics, I, I try and bring a lot of that or all of it into every episode of the podcast to help uh, our listeners understand it from a different perspective. Until we've got strong, randomized control trial evidence about the safety and efficacy of hydroxychloroquine, Dr. I mean, President Trump should stop promoting it. With that in mind, Abdul, do you think this moment we're in right now requires medical professionals to really be leading the charge, disseminating information and educating the public? The hard part about a moment like this is that it's extremely scary and we're facing it down in real time. And the hard part of that is that um, information abounds and it's not always good information. And so, yes, I, I do believe that we need to be leading uh, with science and leading with expertise. We may not always get it right. Every once in a while we get folks who are like, I just completely can't stand your take. Um, and I'm like, that's fine, you know, we're trying to give it to you straight. And that is always the hope with this podcast. I don't know that we always get it right, but we always try. People in Brazil are still poorly informed about the seriousness of what is happening. There are many people who questioned social distancing. They ended up contracting COVID and dying. So people are now forced to acknowledge any misinformation and accept the scientific consensus. With that in mind, I focus on communicating the science without attacking political ideologies. Archila Yamarino, a trained microbiologist and virologist, is a dominant force in Brazil's social media landscape. A decade ago, he was destined for life in the laboratory, but Yamarino quickly realized he could make more of an impact as a science communicator online. In a short few years, he built a massive following, especially on YouTube, distilling complicated scientific topics into comprehensive, easy to digest videos and live streams. And that was all before COVID-19. After the outbreak, Yamarino dedicated his work to informing Brazilians about the virus. 
coronavírus chama corona, porque ele tem uma capinha de gordura por fora dele com espinhos que parece uma coroa. His stature has soared as millions in the country have turned to his videos for answers. Answers that have been sorely lacking in the Brazilian media mix, which tends to focus more on the numbers, less on the science behind them. And when you're taking on a president like Jair Bolsonaro, you need to be pretty confident about the facts, which Yamarino is. My preparation for talking about COVID, turning this information into something comprehensive, comes from more than 10 years of experience in scientific communication online. You found a home on YouTube, but you originally trained as a scientist and a professor. So what made you swap your lab coat for the webcam? Very few people were doing scientific communication in Brazil, and that's still the case. There are great people doing research on COVID here, developing treatments, vaccines, testings, but very few experts are talking publicly about coronavirus. The ones that are, don't really have the experience that I have in virology. So it was easy to decide between being one more average scientist or a strong online science communicator. Seeing how big the audience is, I see now it was the right decision. Can you give us an example of the kind of content that your viewers are tuning in for? And what makes your coverage different from the rest of the Brazilian media? What I'm able to do, which the traditional media can't because of lack of space or expertise, is to analyze the situation as a researcher. So, what causes the virus, or why is it so difficult to do enough tests here? In a more straightforward translation of the scientific research in a way that people can understand. But my most watched video is where I take a study done by Imperial College in the UK, which projected how bad the outbreak could get in the US and England, and I apply that model to Brazil. Seguindo essa projeção aqui, só pela Covid, o Brasil teria 1,4 milhão de mortos até o fim de agosto e só pela Covid. That live stream was very important to show people the seriousness of the problem and the need for urgent action. A necessidade de ação urgente. That live stream went viral, but it was quite controversial, wasn't it? Foi uma live muito tensa, foi um vídeo muito... It was very tense. I spent an hour explaining the details of the projection. What made it go so viral was people thought I had made a prediction of where the pandemic is headed in Brazil. But that wasn't the objective of the video at all. When you reach such a big audience, you can't control how people are going to interpret what you're saying. Neither can you be sure that people will watch the whole hour to fully understand the context. So I lost control of my narrative, which has made me rethink my role. Since then, I've taken on the role of an educator, not only reporting recent facts and figures like the media, but also preparing and educating my audience for what could happen next. What about the political context in which you operate? It seems very challenging. The hardest part is not actually dealing with the president or his followers, but rather the whole politicization of COVID. Science topics such as vaccines or global warming are treated as identity politics. You believe what your group believes. So information won't reach those people. They are entrenched in their group consensus, which many times goes against the scientific information. My challenge is to keep talking about the science without feeding that political tribalism. I just try to talk about what's important, what's recommended, independent of politics. Well, we started the syllabus knowing that something was broken in how the digital public sphere worked. A lot of really high quality content uh, created by people after weeks and months of work uh, would just not be seen by those who need to see it. So what we are trying to do as the syllabus is to fundamentally change the economics of how high quality content gets distributed and how it gets discovered. 
Evgeny Morozov has spent his career critiquing Silicon Valley's internet giants. His first book, The Net Delusion, published in 2011, took aim at the digital utopianism of the time, the talk of social media platforms as engines of emancipation against repressive regimes. Big Tech's recent history, from Google's hand in drone warfare to Facebook and Twitter helping authoritarian governments to silence dissidents, makes the book read more like a prediction. Last year, Morozov, who's originally from Belarus, launched The Syllabus, a multimedia, multilingual newsletter, now with a daily COVID-19 edition. Its target audience is niche, people looking to be educated rather than entertained. What sets the syllabus apart, though, is the way that it selects information, privileging the quality of the content over its appeal to advertisers. In other words, it aims to subvert the Silicon Valley model. Evgeny, in March you started a spin-off of the syllabus called The Politics of COVID-19. How does it work and what can people expect to find there? So essentially, it's a combination of a daily newsletter and an archive all working in tandem, uh, backed by uh, human and algorithmic curation. So, Joanna, maybe you can walk us through some of the selections that uh, you've marked today. So we essentially have scripts and algorithms which uh, generate a short list of some kind, which then our curators and volunteers review in their respective languages. Okay. And then every evening we circulate a newsletter which contains just the highlights. I can search for all articles we've had this week in our system that mentioned COVID. So we've really spent a lot of time finding all the best blogs written by epidemiologists. And today ran a podcast on some of the psychoanalytic effects, actually, of what it means for our psyche, this crisis. There was a very good video with a very interesting uh, scholar called Rob Wallace about uh, COVID-19 and especially its origins in the capitalist uh, food system. And spillover between wild non-human populations and newly urbanized rural areas. I'm interested in how the idea behind the syllabus links to your critique of Silicon Valley. Can you explain what you see as the problem with how we access information at the moment? Sure. Well, the informal motto uh, of the syllabus is that high quality content is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. So much of it gets lost in this cacophony that we have due to this perpetual clicking and favoriting of content, which is there mostly to satisfy the business imperatives of Facebook and uh, Twitter. There are no incentives built into the logic of those platforms to essentially make those videos and those articles easier to discover because they do not bring any advertising revenue but it doesn't anyhow diminish the importance of these articles or content to the public debate at large. So from what I can tell, the selection criteria leans quite heavily on your own opinion about what information is important. How can people trust that by signing up, they're not just entering yet another online echo chamber? Yes, well, uh, from the very beginning of the syllabus, we've uh, decided that we want to be as subjective as it can get. So even though it's a combination of algorithms and human editors, it's the human editors who call all the shots. But beyond that, uh, we also have certain biases and we do not hide them. You know, so our edition about the political economy is called the progressive. We already think that, you know, a lot of the more standard kind of conservative traditional positions are so well represented in the traditional media discourse that, you know, featuring another conservative white man and what he has to say about the future of the world after COVID-19 for us is not a priority. So I would rather find, you know, a woman from uh, Colombia who will and will feature her blog post rather than featuring yet another op-ed from the Wall Street Journal. And we hope that people who are fed up with kind of the uh, sameness of ideas that already circulate in the public media and public sphere of today, the they will appreciate our editorial choice and decision. One of the points Yevgeny Morozov makes about human editors calling the shots, as opposed to algorithms, gets at a fundamental shortcoming in the way that digital news is distributed. Our own biases, along with the imperatives of advertisers, shape 
what we see. And rather than being informed, we just end up with those biases and those beliefs reaffirmed. That's not good enough on any news story, let alone one as serious and as dangerous as COVID-19. You've been watching a special edition of our program on media projects helping us make sense of the coronavirus pandemic. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.